welcome to this month's episode of the Crummy Talk. This month we are talking about knife crime. I have the lovely Megan Robinson and <laughs> the not so lovely Laura Riley. <laughs> and you've got me, Janice, in between. Um, Right. <laughs> in between, yeah. Oh, lovely, not lovely. And just lovely. Tolerable. Yeah. Mm. Tolerable. Just, like, yeah. Tolerable. And um, <laughs> this month we've got it especially on a podcast for you um, because the actual footage is a discussion we've had with a um, gang extraction specialist and youth work, uh, um, not youth work, I'm kind of undermining him here, um, criminologist Craig Pinkney. So if you don't mind, here we go. Hi, I'm we're joined with Urban Youth Specialist and Criminologist Craig Pinkney. I'm hello, really hello, grateful hello. for you to be here. Um, just briefly going to touch up on three quick, quick questions, quick, quick, um, discussing the knife crimes as we already have for this episode. Yes. And it's, as I said, it's our two year anniversary um, for the show. So it's even amazing that we've got our boop, first boop, boop. ever guest. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> our first ever guest. Hopefully the first of many. Um, obviously, we've seen recent years of uh, like high levels of public yeah. anxiety mm-hmm. uh, with regards to like knife crime and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, I just wanted to know what your overall view was of knife crime in this country at the moment. Well, in general. I think f- f- for me, this issue of knife crime has been around for a while now. Mm-hmm. I think all what's happened with the 51 murders in London is kind of able to pull it at the forefront, um, even more so of the public's attention. Mm-hmm. In terms of my thoughts and feelings, as I said, I've been an advocate of anti-knife crime campaigns from as early as 2009. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nine, ten years later, you know, some of the things that I was talking about in 2008 and 9 were still now seen within the society. And I would say even more so has intensified. You know, you've got young people now that are in situations where they're prepared to use knives or any weapon of a sort to kind of deal with their problems um, at any particular time. So for me, my, my major concern is not the soul of the young people and their behaviors, but also the way that society respond to it. I think we have this attitude that it's solely the government's fault. And I will say, is the government's responsibility to resource, to fund, to invest back into community as well as youth services? However, we also need to think about what the other facets are in terms of, you know, who else can help. Yeah. Community, education, health, housing, um, businesses, yeah, local businesses is such more than the government. Um, and because of the current climate of what we're seeing right now, I honestly don't believe I see anything getting better until it gets a little bit more worse. Um, and I think that is the the sad side to it that unfortunately it's like in order for our society to respond yeah it's like we need people to die you know in order for our society to be like oh no way it's a problem it's like that notion where um you know like if that idea that someone else is going to deal with it you know when for example everyone uses this analogy like if somebody was bleeding on the street a million people around but everyone assumes that someone else is going to deal with it so nobody deals with it and then that person, the person dies, dies. Yeah. it's like no way maybe i should have yeah maybe you know it's we late. knew this maybe we could have everybody's going to say could have should have until that person died and i think for me more particularly why i believe it is an epidemic and it's something that we need to talk about is because the proponents of those that are victims tends to be a lot of individuals from black and ethnic minority groups and going back to your notion before about it, leaving it as someone else's problem, a lot of people have felt that maybe the problem is sold in specifically for black and ethnic minority groups. And the reality is it actually impacts other groups. Yeah. And I also believe that is partially one of the reasons why maybe people are now saying knife crime is of a concern because the colours of skin that we see involved in criminality, knife crime and those particular behaviours it's not the generic and the, the narrative that we often are taught within the media and the wider sense of what knife crime is and where it comes from. In saying that regarding, um, brings us to our next question, regarding narratives and the media's mm-hmm. influence. Um, obviously in the 80s, I wasn't born then. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was not born in the 80s. But um, obviously, I've done a bit of research on like media's influence on crime and stuff, but we obviously saw in the 80s street disorders and the media's yeah. mm-hmm. um, notion to 
you know, exaggerate and over sensationalize um, reports based on blacks and committing crime, etc., and the street violence. Mm -hmm. and it gave the public a view that yeah. you know black people are only good for one thing. Mm -hmm. And do you think that it's kind of his essentially history mm -hmm. repeating itself with the way the media are currently influencing the public's view on knife crime? Of course, and I think. One of the things that we need to study, and I'm glad you've mentioned the word history, we need to study how groups that have entered into this country have been treated by a society and a media that fuels that perception and narrative, whether it's negative or positive, about that particular group. You know, and we can go back even further to the times when, you know, the Windrush era, you know, when we first came and it was like, oh my God, the people in the Caribbean are here. And then sometime after that, do you remember when the Yardies are now here and they're coming here to sell drugs, they're coming here to, you know, to rape your kids. And then you look at every other group that's come since then and how they've been treated in the media. So, you know, you're looking at the Asian community now, Muslim community, Muslim Asian community now. And what do we see in the, in the media? What are they saying? They're yeah, terrorists, exactly. they're it's individuals. Crazy. But it's before crazy. September 11th, who were the terrorists? The Irish? You know, so if I asked you the same question 20 years ago, what does a terrorist look like? Subconsciously in your mind without saying it, I already know that you've got a, some sort of features in your hair of an Irish looking man. If I say the same question to you now, in 2018, you've got a Asian guy, predominantly South Southern Asian, mm -hmm. with a beard maybe, that you believe is going to commit a particular attack. So the media is very instrumental in terms of shaping perception, shaping ideas, shaping and understanding about a social phenomena yeah. and trying to get us to understand what it is and what that looks like and if it's then by default <clears throat> not based on statistics not based on a true narrative and a reflection of what's taking place in society then we're oftentimes going to get those negative perceptions yeah. so i'm not saying that black communities don't have issues of knife crime I am not saying black and ethnic minority groups are not involved in criminality. Mm -hmm. However, when the narrative is, is pushed that it's only these people committing those crimes, that's when it becomes the problem. And it becomes even a more um, problem when you look at you know, the way that people are treated within criminal justice, yeah. harsher sentencing. We're talking about longer sentences compared to white counterparts. We look at treatment within prison estates in terms of how individuals are treated, post-release how individuals are treated and we can go to mental health and look at the exact same thing you know we're talking about a um an over representation of black males black females in mental health institutions over medicated so when we're looking at disparity links back to the david lammy report and we're looking at you know the um the racial um disparity report that was put out last year at the end of the year and what does it say it says the same thing but we can go back to 1999 and McPherson's report after Stephen Lawrence was killed, and what did it say? It said that all institutions within the UK are institutionally racist, mm -hmm. and media is also part of one of those institutions. So if we know that, and in 2018 the data suggests the same thing, then we cannot be naive to think that that projection and that narrative is being pushed by somebody or something to make the wider society believe and perceive that it's only individuals from specific groups yeah. that are involved in these particular crimes. I was saying, I was listening to all of that and I was just taking it in. <laughs> Sorry. Nice and I was like, so like, like some of the reports, I was like, yeah, I've read that. Nice I've read so that, good, so that. Um, but I think even for those that are watching, you know, when we're having these discussions about crime and violence, it's important that we stay up to date with what people are saying in terms of report, reports and knowledge. You know, coming from our own personal experience is amazing, it's good. But if we're not linking that to data that's out there, and there are things that are available out there that gives us a better understanding to be able to argue with conviction as opposed to just our personal whim. Right, um, some really fantastic points there from um, Craig. And I'm really hoping that you guys go out and actually have a look at the previous and um, predecessors' work, etc., because it will help shape your mm -hmm. thoughts about current issues and potentially how you can help prevent you know, future issues. Um, and just the final question, in your opinion, do you mm -hmm. think there are, I know you've mentioned and touched on some, uh, but do you think there are actually, there is a solution? Um, I think there are solutions. I don't think there's a solution. Mm -hmm. I think there's a solution. There are a series of solutions, sorry. Um, and I think for me, it's about where and how are those solutions put forth and how realistic are they are achieving.
so yeah that was the video um of us discussing things with craig mm -hmm. um this month about knife crime if you can take a look and select the links and listen to our discussion um about the in, um issue with knife crime and we have linked it to criminological um perspectives and theories what did you think of the interview yeah um, interesting. really interesting mm -hmm. i think some things that we'd already kind of picked up and discussed but yeah. some things that we really haven't um yeah, yeah, some stuff, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. so if you've got um any views or any opinions or anything you don't understand or you'd like to speak to us in depth about um just get in touch with us on our social media as usual and you've been lovely audience and we have been the crummy talk mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you